Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is the Impact Festival uh, participating in the Cultural Sunday. Um, is there anyone who doesn't speak English in the audience? It's a Cultural Sunday, so we're not sure what audience we're having. Um, it's important because our next presentation will be in English, unfortunately, because it's by a non Dutch speaking um, guest. Um, first, a little bit on the occasion here uh, Cultural Sunday, the Impact Festival. Uh, we're preparing for the 25th Impact Festival, as it will happen from October 29th to November 2. Uh, soft Machines, researching the relationship between man and machine, um, questioning uh, empathetic. Uh, intelligence, whether that is possible or not, uh, and how we as humans participating in a technology structure, structured uh, society are maybe changing our behavior, behavior and persona. Um, 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 so that's uh, the core of the upcoming Impact Festival. It's also uh, what this uh, Sunday afternoon is about. Um, our next guest, um, Natalie Dixon, is the co-founder of the Amsterdam Bay Bureau Effect Lab. And her talk will be about effective computing. Please welcome Natalie Dixon. Can you hear me? Is this okay? There we go. Is this still okay? Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for coming. I am the co-founder of Affect Lab and as you can see, we're into digital emotion research and thank you for being so gracious to think I could talk on effective computing, but I must be uh, honest and say, I am not an effective computerist, I'm not a tech head, I'm someone who's incredibly interested in technology and specifically people's entanglement with technology. So our research and my curiosity at Affect Lab is about people's entanglement with their mobile phones specifically, and emotion and our relationships to each other. And emotional transactions and tasks are something that we're doing all the time and they're mediated through digital technology. And often through blogging and self-initiated projects, we look at this and what it means for our social relationships. So what, uh, what we were saying a minute ago, the wider social context. And in this talk, I'd like to focus on these emotional transactions and these tasks that we perform all the time. And what do they mean for our notions of intimacy? I'm going to do this by way of a few case studies. So I'll show you a few things. And then I will give it my own commentary and a little bit of context. And specifically, I'm going to focus on two themes, or trends, if you like. So the first is the idea, and I'm not sure how many of you were here for the presentation right before this, which was about robotics, which is very interesting. But my first trend relates a little bit to that. Um, so it would be helpful if you were here for that, and maybe a nice, interesting uh, response to that. The idea that we, whoever we is, should put the human back into technology. And then the second theme is that when you put the human back into technology, it means we have to turn flesh into data. So the first case study is actually the film that you just saw. Uh, a few people just arrived late, so perhaps there's only a few people who haven't seen it. But it's a very interesting and sweet film that was just shown now. It's called Somebody. So uh, for those of you who just walked in, I'm going to talk a little bit through it and I'll describe the scene. So Somebody is a uh, film uh, and also an app for download and it's by the actress and creative Miranda July. She's actually in the film, she's the lady with the really curly hair in the restaurant who gets proposed to by a stranger. And, and this is a part commentary. And it's also uh, a social experiment, I think. And the tagline says it all. It should be there. It says, uh, when you can't be there, somebody can. So it's the idea that through location-based technology, in this case a mobile application, you can send a very emotional message to somebody. 
uh, through somebody else, an emotional proxy, if you like. So think of it like a slightly high-tech version of a singing telegram. And the project is this beautifully shot film and the app, like I mentioned. So as you can probably see, if you've just watched the film, it's, it's a parody. Uh, I'm not sure she means us to take it seriously, like it's some sort of realistic future scenario. It's, it's more a play. And it asks lots of interesting questions. Do we and will we ever consider this routine? The idea of using an emotional proxy. Would you? So, in a way, it talks about mediation, digital technology, it talks about intimacy, and in a very sweet way, in a very amusing kind of way, it asks you, so how far would you go? How far would I go? In the scene in the movie where uh, Miranda July gets proposed to, so there's a stranger, um, for those of you who didn't see it, uh, a woman sitting at a restaurant, uh, she's enjoying a meal, she's clearly on her own, and a stranger comes along, she looks at her phone, she's just received a message from somebody, she goes down on one knee and proposes marriage to a woman seated at the restaurant. The idea being that she fills in for the missing partner, the person, in this case the man who was going to propose. So, the idea of making technology more human is a very present theme in projects of and about digital intimacy. And as part of this, actually there is the scene just on the top right. As part of this, there exists the strategy that human senses should somehow be captured, quantified, and used in technology. So, to expand on this theme a little further, my second case study I'd like to show you, it's called The Poking Machine. It's something I saw a few years ago at a conference in Amsterdam, and I really enjoyed it. It's a playful artwork by two students, one of them pictured here, Jasper van Loon and Bartholomew Traubeck. And it's a wearable device, as you can see, and it physically pokes a person whenever a friend virtually pokes them on Facebook. So you know how the poke works poke somebody on Facebook and they receive a notification. In this case, the poking machine consists of a custom-built circuit, connects to an Android phone, that tracks the incoming pokes, and then a circuit is housed in this colored laser-cut box that the person wears on their arm, and then they get physically poked. So like the film, I think the poking machine is also a parody. It's a parody in our virtual behavior translated into the real world. It seems that while we are happy to poke away on Facebook, the artists are poking fun at us, actually. But what it does do is speculate a little bit on the idea of physical expressions in the virtual realm. And specifically, this emphasizes the idea of touch. So, like I mentioned before, this is a theme as part of quantifying the human senses to make technolo technology more like us. And if you were here for the first presentation, you will see that even robots look like us. They're anthropomorphized, so you know, they have uh, hair and they have clothing and they even look like creatures out of Star Trek. So, in the clothing, not quite the ears. But in the same vein, there's also the concept that other human senses can be quantified. For example, the concept of smell, so as a way to produce and circulate emotion. So the next case study I'd like to show you is this, the O-Phone. It's been developed by a Harvard professor, David Edwards. He's quite famous. He runs a test lab in Paris. And the O-Phone functions like a cell phone, but instead of uh, voice and data, being transmitted, you transmit olfactory data, in other words, smells. So much in the same way you would send a text message, you can send a smell. And Edwards is also working on the functionality that allows you to send custom-made smells. So in this incredible Proustian fantasy come true, you can imagine you could send an O message to your sister embedded with your grandmother's cookie smell. And the project I think beautifully exploits the idea of smell to evoke memory and emotion, and in the process, it creates a kind of language, an emotional language. And I argue, probably much more expressive and more emotional than smiley faces and other emoticons. So, moving on to the next project, or case study, 
this is a mobile technology project out of Berlin uh, from the Design Research Lab. And the researcher who made this explores the idea of using a mobile device uh, that's a lot more agile than the ones we have right now. And it allows for the owner to more intuitively gauge or understand what needs to be done next. So it's quite animalistic, you'll see in the next little slide. But it's a sort of techno animal. It even has a mechanical breath and heartbeats. And both of these physiological reactions can become accelerated in response to emotion. So, for example, when a new lover calls, the device actually creates this really strange humping action to show excitement. And if the user misses the call, then it becomes agitated in response. And the only way you can calm it down is by stroking it, like, like a little hamster. You know, you stroke the hamster and you pat it and he calms, he or she calms down. But this one has a breath and a heartbeat. It, it feels very organic. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell it's, it's relaxed right now. Oh, oh now, missed call, a new call. <sighs> new girlfriend, maybe. Very exciting. Uh, uh, how do we calm it down? Hmm. Uh, you give it a pat behind the ears and, and everything is alright again. So, So, so far we've spoken about using our fellow humans as emotional proxies and smells and very novel ideas like the, the slide we just saw about embodiment. But when we're talking about intimacy, we have to get onto the subject of kissing. And in this project here, it's called the EEG Kiss. It's by a Dutch artistic duo, Lancel and Mart. And they investigate how can a kiss be translated into data? So as pictured here, you see the artists wear these EEG headsets. Um, and for those of you who don't know, EEG is a, a records electrical activity along the scalp, and it measures voltage fluctuations uh, that result from the ionic currents uh, within the neurons of the brain. So, and as you can see pictured here, people uh, in the picture are kissing, and it results in data on a screen. And it is actually a very literal translation neural data and, and the relationship it has to kissing. So I, I don't think it, on the surface it's a very complicated project in this picture, but in the process they ask very complicated questions. Can we measure a kiss? And what kissing partners feel? Can we transfer a kiss and intimacy online? Do we want to save our private kisses, maybe to be used by others? In fact, this idea is not new. It's been fascinating researchers for a while. And the same researcher behind the very cute and strange humping hamster, um, he also developed a prototype where people can use a mobile device that telecommunicates the kiss. So you would somehow give the instruction into your mobile device and it would transport a kiss to the person you were sending it to and actually express a little bit of liquid onto the face of the person as they were using it. This kind of ridiculous notion. But again, this is a technological concept that involves translating very physical intimacy into data. So, kissing seems like the starter course, because we're here to talk about digital intimacy. And if we're talking about intimacy, we have to eventually talk about sex. So, this too has been the subject of a lot of speculation recently, in research and as well as popular culture. And for those of you who don't know the scene, it's from the Spike Jones movie called Her. And it gives us the narrative of Theo, and Theo is pictured right there. It's the man in brown pants and the pink shirt. He's a character who falls in love with his operating system called Samantha. And in various scenes of the movie, Theo takes Samantha out to places like the beach here. They have long conversations and equally long walks. <laughs> And Samantha can see the beach, just in case you, you didn't realize, but she, she can see the beach through the camera of the phone. So that's why I pictured that there. She's with him, in a sense. So in real life, people do use uh, voice command assistants in their mobile phones, like Siri, and they search for directions, or they set reminders. But I think there's always this lingering question. Does Siri, for example, love me? In my own analysis of YouTube videos as part of Affect Lab research, I've watched hundreds of YouTube videos 
where people show you instructionally uh, how to ask for tips uh, using Siri, things you could ask her or him because it comes in two versions. And it always starts off with something really functional like uh, where is the nearest Thai restaurant? Um, but always by the third question, it turns to love. And the question is, Siri, do you love me? So this movie asks exactly the same question. It takes a contemporary tension and it catapults it into the future. And this, the character Theo and Samantha have uh, long, deep chats and way deep into the night. Um, and one thing leads to another and eventually the characters in the movie seem to need or want to consummate their relationship. So Samantha suggests to Theo that they use a sexual proxy. So this is a person, a real person, who would embody Samantha, the operating system, so to speak, as a way for her and Theo to physically connect. So as you can see pictured here, the proxy, this is the lady pictured, wears a small earpiece that allows her to hear Samantha, the operating system, and Theo hears Samantha too. So they both hear her at the same time. And the woman pictured here is totally mute the whole time. She's not supposed to say anything during this act. And in a sense, she's kind of an avatar. But unlike in virtual reality games, where people create avatars to represent them in the virtual world, well, in this instance, the very reverse happens. The virtual gets physical. So, in case you haven't seen the movie, what happens next is, well, Theo can't go through with it. There's this massive anticlimax for the audience, for Theo, and especially for Samantha, the operating system. So there seems to be some translation of virtual to real and real back to virtual, and some more successful than others. We have pokes, we have smells, we have kisses. They seem to all be in translation into the virtual. But the heightened expression of intimacy, at least in this film as it's suggested, might be eluding us. Perhaps this is what William Gibson was referring to in his science fiction novel, Neuromancer, when he spoke about data made flesh. Perhaps we will feel more comfortable with less physical intimacy, that perhaps the holy grail of some sort of virtual turned physical hookup is not the real goal. So this seems to already be happening in Japan, where, uh, according to the media, young people have stopped having sex. And Japan is, in many ways, thanks to their amazing strides in digital technology, seen as a forerunner in digital trends, and social trends too. So to quote from an article uh, in the Guardian newspaper, Japan's under-40s appear to be losing interest in conventional relationships. Millions aren't even dating and increasing numbers can't be bothered with sex. For their government, celibacy syndrome is part of a looming national catastrophe. Japan already has one of the lowest birth rates. Its population of 126 million has been shrinking for the past decade. It's projected to plunge a further one third by 2060. And a commentator in the article says, the country is experiencing a flight from human intimacy. So I was very interested in this article and I pressed on a little further and I went to some other sources to see, well, what do other media in other countries say about the same topic? And I found similar sentiments in the New York Times. Last year, an article was published to explore the idea that we're experiencing the end of courtship, so a related idea that hanging out is the new dating. Getting to know each other involves a rifle through a Facebook profile followed by a string of text messages, some flirty, some cryptic, but mostly non-committal. If in between all the non-dates in the virtual world there's actually a real-life hookup, it's most likely a group hangout with your online crush and their friends. I pressed on. I wanted to know more. I found a British journalist who wrote in The Telegraph that some virtual intrigue even becomes actual, real life, human interaction, and perhaps more. But mostly, the journalist writes, I found myself in a perpetual state of limbo, stuck somewhere between a first encounter, 
a hookup, and a full-blown relationship. So to summarize the thread of these three articles, it seems a lot of people are more than just a little confused about what actual dating is. But if anything, this talk is not to emphasize that technology is to blame for some sort of lack of human intimacy, not at all. Rather, I want to explore the forms of intimacy emerging from our techno-human relationship without creating categories of human on the one side and machine on the other. I want to look at this relationship as a union that deserves to be explored together, not separately, without trying to transport human pokes and senses and emotional experiences into data. It just reminds me of the idea that somehow we can capture human consciousness and download it into a machine. It's ridiculous. In the same way, I'm arguing we cannot capture human emotional experience and translate them into machine or machine them into human. What all these projects or case studies serve to show is, well, they're a very light-hearted commentary on a much more philosophical concept. What does it mean to be human? And the concept I'd like to introduce today, right now, is what does it mean to be post-human? And by post-human, I mean post-biological existence, when we look beyond biology, to an entity that incorporates the human and machine in an intimate hybrid. A very literal example of a hybrid can be found in people using artificial limbs or a pacemaker. These are technologies that advance human functioning, and they form part of the human body. But it shifts focus a little bit from something that neither entities can do on their own, only together. So in a machine-human hybrid, the world is rearranged. It goes beyond function and purpose to something else, something more open, something we can't even yet articulate. When you think of post-humans, people often think of the most extreme version, the idea of cyborgs, depicted in science fiction movies and films, as these uh, dramatic metal and flesh hybrids. We always tend to think of Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator. And to expand on this, I want to take it in a slightly different direction. I'd like to turn to the great techno-science theorist and professor, the American writer Donna Haraway. She became very well known, <coughs> amongst other things, her cyborg manifesto a paper she wrote on the subject in the 1980s. Her work is much less about these Hollywood Terminator types that we all know so well, but instead her work interrogates what do we consider nature and what do we consider culture? And in this case, what do we consider human and machine? So she refutes the divisions between them and she literally fuses them. She coined the term nature culture, one word. She suggests that the social stuff that joins humans and machines is stuff that constitutes both. She calls it a kind of liveliness. It goes on between both human and non-human. And who humans are is made up of those relationships. So in other words, we are always tangled up in technology in ways that make us, machines, and the world around us different that we live hybrid lives with machines, and by this I mean your mobile phone, your toothbrush even, your laptop, your pacemaker. That machines have agency too. Things we call nature and culture don't exist as neatly packaged entities, but rather they're much more dynamic processes. And like anything and any relationship, I think it's equally important that we acknowledge there's emotional baggage. Machines and people have history. That many, if not most technologies, were born through military means. If that was then, and this is now, how do we feel about participating in networks that use our emotional experiences and our memories as a way to make money? Your moment of intimacy, that photo you just posted to Facebook, well, it was used to create a new opportunity for a company to advertise their vacuum cleaner back to you and your friends. It might also mean that we can recognize intimacy for its very subversive qualities, too. I recently came across a project by a Berlin artist called uh, Melanie Banajo. She takes selfies, but not in the way you know it. She's either crying in her selfies, 
She looks really depressed, extremely unattractive. And her series is titled The Anti-Selfie. So in trying to humanize technology, which I think many of these projects do, and in a very interesting way, it also says something interesting about us. How do we see ourselves in this techno-human relationship? Are we heroic humans at the center of all things? Are machines emotionally deficient orphans in the lab that need our help? Are we emotionally deficient humans in desperate need of machine loving? None of the above and all of the above. I think it's much more productive to focus on our new family and try and understand forms of intimacy in the context of our new family life, our nature culture connections. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dixon. Um, maybe people have questions in the audience. I'd like to open up um, this talk to the audience. Anyone with a question? Um, maybe I can start. Towards the end, you mentioned, uh, for instance, the influence of the, the military in these kinds of developments. Um, I think there are many other commercial forces, maybe. Art can play a role in it. What do you see as the most um, important force behind um, uh, developments in the techno-human uh, sphere? So what I think is interesting, and what happened a lot in the previous talk, is that we um, celebrate and evangelize robots, and we, we start telling really um, techno-utopian stories. You know, they're incredible. The, the robot smiles, and we all laugh, and we clap, and it's amazing. <laughs> But actually, stories are much darker than that. Um, where robots come from, where cell phones come from, the history of cell phones is, uh, is military. They would, it was a military communication device that was then commercialized in Scandinavia and then brought out to the rest of the world. And um, stories are important. Narratives is how we um, make understanding in real life and in, in between each other. And when we tell stories, well, stories have beginnings and histories. And if those histories are military, we need to be cognizant of that. It means something for us. They don't just come from nowhere. It's not like yeast. It doesn't grow on its own. And uh, it has implications for gender, too. You know. And I didn't bring up the gender of the robot for no reason. I think it's interesting. Um, yeah, stories reinforce stereotypes and, and norms. And we need to be really uh, cognizant. And Vanessa, the previous speaker, I really liked her point. She said we have to be responsible for ourselves and for the things, uh, robots and machines we devise, and how we form relationships with them. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, a little bit at least, but um, maybe let me continue, because um, you referred to Japan, the situation in Japan. Um, also, uh, Vanessa had an example of a, a Gemini robot developed in Japan. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, what can we... Um, um, tell from the difference between how these developments in Japan uh, are perceived and are, in your opinion, more advanced. I mean, they are ahead of us, that's what you said. Um, Vanessa, um, in her lecture, maybe not, but elsewhere, I, I heard her making the point that, okay, maybe in Japan um, robots will be part of society much faster than uh, in, in Europe or in the States. What, what can you tell about the cultural differences and how these influence um, how fast a society will deal with these kinds of develop developments and how, how they em are embracing these developments or keep them, keeping them up. Yeah, I think there's always going to be countries like Japan who have an enormous appetite for uh, technological adoption and um, uh, kind of frontier countries for technological development. So, and Japan is one of them. Um, but it's always interesting to see what effect that has on social movements, um, relationships between people. That's not to say that it, and it's culturally relative, right? So that's not to say it would happen here or in South Africa or anywhere else. But um, I think, uh, yeah, whatever happens in Japan, it always piques my interest because it's so extreme. And whenever you do research, and especially into mobile culture, you go to the extremes. That's where you find the most interesting stuff. So in that sense, it offers us an extreme. It's not to say it gets rolled out in the same way in other places. It just offers us a very fertile research ground. And, and, and this specific trend I see 
coming in more subtle forms, like I mentioned in the in Britain and in, in America. So something I picked up on. Yeah, it kind of connects to my first question because I don't think from Japan you can say that there's a, a military industry behind these kind of developments. Um, and still, they are the, the one to pick up the, the fastest. Um, well, not one that we know of. No. I, I'm not an expert on the um, origins of a lot of Japanese techno development, but um, I think uh, if you were to research technological devices, objects, processes in Japan, I'm almost certain they would come out of military uh, labs, mm -hmm. uh, military origins. I could almost guarantee. Maybe someone in the audience knows. You have a question or a comment? Uh, well, maybe I can shed a little bit of light on that. Uh, the last point that you mentioned, because you know what we have seen throughout history is that most fundamental technologies, most technologies which are fundamentally new and which get applied for the first time, indeed do get applied in a military context. What we see in Japan is a further development of technologies that have been already applied in the military context, which are now being applied to new things. So the applications are new, the fundamentals are not. I think you're absolutely right. A lot of fundamentals get applied in the military context first. Uh, but uh, technology also has the capacity to you know, break down barriers to access. So we might be now living in a time, I think, uh, where we might see some fundamental developments which do not come from a military corner, simply because the amount of investment necessary to do fundamental research has dropped so significantly compared to earlier times. Mm. Thanks. More questions from the audience over there? or? You want the microphone? Uh, I can speak loudly if that's okay. Yeah, loud. Um, only last week we had a screening of her uh, in relation to impact, and uh, indeed we were talking about Samantha and the operating system and um, her feelings. And there was a link to uh, Frankenstein, the doctor who created this creature, and um, about our responsibility to work towards operating systems who start to have feelings and emotions. And I was wondering um, whether you think that our responsibilities are towards operating systems that start to have uh, emotions and maybe feel love for one of the humans, or um, where is the line and how should we guide that process? So. Uh, just to be clear, yeah. um, Samantha doesn't have feelings. She uh, can't have feelings. She is um, a piece of code. Um, she's an algorithm. So she understands feelings. She can respond to feelings, but she doesn't actually have feelings. So that's a big difference. Um, but you're talking about really classic moments in science fiction narratives and in movies. You know, Dave, don't unplug me, Dave, no. You know, it's Hell 2000, it's whatever the movie's called, Odyssey. But you know that. 2001 Space Odyssey. That's the standard humor. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we don't want to kill machines. Um, and machines, well, we don't know if they want to kill us. <laughs> but um, it's. Uh, yeah, it's a question of responsibility, I suppose. Um, and it's very subjective. But to answer your question, you know, uh, it, it, it comes back to where you place the person and the machine in this continuum. So uh, my point in the talk was that machines and humans are not uh, supposed to be in binary opposites. We have a new type of kinship, a new type of family, so when we consider, like you're saying, how do you respond to this uh, type of what you see as emotional expression? Well, it's completely new, and that's why we find it difficult to deal with. I don't have the answers, because we're in the middle of it. This is the first time we can respond in this way to the question and ask more questions about it. But my point is that we need to develop a new approach to how we think about that, not as a machine, a human, but rather as a machine-human combi, a kinship. It's a new thing. It's, yeah. I want to say it's a new species, but that gets too weird and technical. Um, I have another question. It does relate to responsibility. Um, um, like, for instance, we saw in Vanessa Ava's presentation examples of how robots are used in homes for the elderly. Um, and I can imagine that in the future this will create complicated situations where people get attached uh, to these robots are dealing with the same questions. Do I feel, need to feel sorry uh, if 
the robot falls down or uh, are g we're getting depending, uh, dependent on, on these kinds of technologies. What's your stand on, on responsibility in this field? Where does it lie by developers, people that apply it? Should we as people develop a different sense of how responsibility for these technologies is different from real humans? Sure. I mean, I think responsibility is just a nice way of saying ethics, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, what are the ethics around robot love? Or, you know, even self-driving cars, this is a big thing. So, uh, when a, ro a self-driving car needs to make the decision about whether to um, essentially kill the driver by smashing into a wall or, or, and avoid killing the kids crossing the road, what are the ethics around that? I mean, this is the... Uh, a tense intersection of ethics and essentially philosophy and uh, technological development. And it's a very interesting space. Uh, yeah, so as, as personal, uh, in a personal vein, uh, well, my grandmother has seen all dementia and um, the seal, um, if you're familiar with it, the little white seal, I would gladly buy her one and I'm sure she would really enjoy it. Uh, what is her responsibility towards that? Very little. She doesn't know. What is your responsibility towards her, giving her a seal, making her emotionally attached to what is a dead thing, basically? Yeah, well, it, I suppose, and this is getting really anecdotal now, but it, it would give her a lot of joy. Um, and also, these are uh, actually in the last scene of somebody where you see the, the pot plant and the two people, and weirdly the woman seems to be enjoying what the pot plant is experiencing. This is the same thing with the furry animal which is actually non-human, so, and then a human being. It's a cybernetic exchange, so energy flows between objects and people in ways that make them feel certain things, and it's no different. So she's just, uh, Miranda July just made this incredibly funny skit from it, but the same thing happens with the furry animal and my grandmother. So, uh, yeah, I think in that way it's unavoidable. Those things happen. And I think what I'm saying is to approach these things in, in, uh, with new eyes. And, and I don't have the answers, I'm simply suggesting a new approach. And so and that's what I'm advocating. Yeah. Questions? I'll, I'll bring you the microphone. Um, what happens with the results of these uh, emotions of affect love? Yeah, so a lot of the work we do, and it's mostly me, I'm the editor of the blog, is I speculate about certain post-human conditions. So I will pick out projects and I'll blog about it as a way to raise examples and case studies and, and get people's comments on that. But also we self-initiate projects. Uh, one of the projects we did uh, now a few years ago was about food and emotion. So we developed um, a project that um, was kind of a food mood barometer and it took sentiment across the world about how people were feeling about the food that they were eating. Which was really interesting for me at a time where the web became emotional and you wanted to tap in and feel, what was this, you know? How does the web become emotional? In a sense, it's a big machine, I'm interested in emotion, so there it was. So yeah, we initiate projects ourselves and then uh, a lot of it is about blogging, to theorize, to raise more questions, and then obviously to participate with people who have similar questions. Thank you. Other questions? Maybe, yeah? Um, we, uh, we live in a world with action-reaction, and I mean by that, that with uh, globalization, there's also the, the anti-trend uh, localization, that's globalization is a concept. Do you see that because of all this technology, there is a counter-trend on more enrichment of social, physical interaction, that that, uh, that there's a uh, counter-movement uh, that also happens? Yeah, and maybe what, what you're saying in different words is Nostalgia. I think there's a lot of nostalgia around personal and human interaction, even in the objects that we have, uh, you know, that uh, vinyl or 
um, even the covers for cell phones, which are you know the old tape player. But there's this huge developing and ever-growing wave of nostalgia for these things. People who don't have cell phones are incredibly cool. People are not on Facebook. Wow, it couldn't be cooler. So um, I think we are rejecting certain social network practices, certain technology, in a way to, uh, yeah, to, to feed our nostalgia about things. But I think you're right, there is a nostalgia for that. I'm not sure it means anything. I think anywhere we go forward, and, or forward, that's a strange word, uh, we go on. And, uh, and these things will happen. It's, it feels for me like a, a, a necessary evolution. Um, but it just means that we, like I said before, have to have approaches. How do we see it? With what eyes? And what stories do we tell about it? Do we celebrate robots like uh, in this uh, evangelistic way? Do we go dystopian on it, like the media often does? Robots will take over the world. Drones will take over the world. We have agency. Machines have agency. We participate. So uh, I think those are just important things to acknowledge. I'm, su I'm surprised you only call it nostalgia because um um, technology is a, is a new. Um, you you could say that be there. There are three arts. Uh, I have a relationship with him, and technology makes it a, a, a relationship of three. And then our relationships changes as well. There's not only nostalgia. There is a new definition on uh, how important it is for us to relate, and uh, that uh, and maybe that can be very much enriching as a physical relationship because there is a device and not only because of nostalgia. I agree. More questions? Yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, I was interested in, you mentioned uh, Don Hardaway and the Cyborg Manifesto, and I was interested in the cybernetic self, and specifically in your research or case studies, if you've noticed any difference in the way people experience emotions who have integrated machinery into their body, specifically like examples, not like classes, but examples like pacemakers, um, the, the box for Parkinson's patients, or people who have prosthetics, and how you see that might be extended in the future because um, the cybernetic self is very likely to be in the next 20 or 30 years to become a greater and greater part of our society. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think uh, these things are slow moving as well, that you don't see evidence of it immediately on the surface. So, you know, the post human, what form that takes, uh, whether it's a man or a woman with prosthesis or somebody with a Google Glass, well, that's easy enough to see. What changes it uh, has, or implications it has for your emotional experiences, it's much harder to see. But I speak to uh, the research of, or I'd like to point to the research of people like uh, Sherry Turkle, and I think she does very interesting and important work along these lines, where she talks about, uh, um, well, her book is titled Alone and Together, and the idea that, um, and it's a very sad notion, that uh, feelings are no longer generated um, outside of the network, that in fact feelings are made as part of the network, so that somebody would text to feel, uh, to make it a little clearer that if um, there was a feeling amongst or in a person to have an emotional experience, they would turn to the network first. So to validate and form and create some sort of emotional experience, it, it would be reliant on Facebook and friends and likes and shares. And in, in a sense, what she's saying is that emotional experiences are formed in the network, that they're not independent of it, which is a very interesting thought. So uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of my stuff or research is in the virtual space, not so much in physical prosthesis and things. So, um, but I found that research interesting. Uh, which Sherry Toko was saying. Um, from Donna Haraway's perspective, this is much more complicated. Um, hers is actually a metaphor. So she doesn't actually deal with robotics. This is not a woman who builds robots, you know. Um, she uses them as metaphors to say things about how we approach this relationship. So she talks a lot about power structures. 
when we build robots, what does it mean for... Uh, there was actually this robot here, a really interesting moment there in that speech where uh, the robot was built for KLM. The robot would be programmed to approach a family in the airport to help them on their journey. I don't know if you were here for this. And uh, the robot would go towards the person in the family who had the, the, the power base. So in the talk Vanessa mentioned, the robot would go towards the father and ask the father of the family, would you need help in the movement of your journey? Where are you going next? Where is your check-in gate? And I was just thinking, what does this mean for re-establishing normative or um, existing stereotypes about family dynamics? The robot would pick uh, the, the male head of the family. But what about um, two women and their kids? How would that work? What would the robot think then? Of course, they would have to program algorithms for that. But it's interesting that computer scientists and engineers, and I don't mean to stereotype them, often think in those ways. They reinforce those stereotypes when they build that technology. And that's what Haraway is talking about. Um, oh, um, if I might also respond to that. I don't think, I think she just found out, Vanessa Avis, that there's a whole different dynamic um, um, developing when the robot would approach a woman apart from the man. So I don't think she's being making any judgment that they just found out that based on the research it's important that you either have the, the computer address the woman or the man or the child uh, all with very different to figure out, outcomes. Yeah. Um, okay, if there are no more questions then we will continue uh, the program. First please uh, a warm applause for Natalie Dixon. Thank you.